Well, good morning, church family. This morning, I wanted to share with you a little bit uh, out of scripture about Jesus calling the disciples and saying, come and follow me and I will make you fishers of men. I, I love how God uses relatable human things to help us understand who he is and what he desires for our lives particularly in the New Testament, where Jesus uses all of these like ag-based parables about planting, harvesting, cultivating, and so on. One of the greatest defenses about the importance of rural ministry that I like to share with people is simply just what Jesus taught, where Jesus taught, um, who Jesus spoke to, the people that he taught, and, and where he sent his disciples. So, so often, uh, it was rural things spoken to rural people uh, about ag and rural based things and then when Jesus sent his disciples not only did he send them to the cities but he very specifically sent them to the rural and in-between places the places that are often unseen forgotten or seen as unimportant and he sent them there those disciples to proclaim the good news that the kingdom of God has come and to repent to follow the Lord so today I want to share with you one of my favorite Bible stories and two things that I think that we should keep in mind. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 4. And in Matthew chapter 4, starting in verse 17, it says that Jesus began preaching, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And then while he was walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who is also called Peter, and Andrew, his brother. And they were casting nets into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Jesus called those first disciples to come and follow him and that he would make them fishers of men. I think that Jesus is still calling and still equipping regular people like you and me to follow him and that he will make us fishers of people to go out to seek and to save. Because of this, because I think that the Lord is still calling, that he is still sending, and that he will continue to do so. I want to share with you two simple ways how we can fail at fishing. <laughs> two simple ways to fail at fishing. I think that the first way that we can fail at fishing is by having unkept equipment. When you go out and you pick up your rod and your reel and you want to go fishing, if you haven't taken time to make sure that the line is cared for, that things are oiled, that you've got a good lure on, it's just not going to be a good fishing trip. The same thing is if you go to your boat and if you're someone who fishes by boat. There's a story about a couple that they liked to go out on their small boat every now and again. They had it for a long time and it was never that important, but it was something that they enjoyed doing. And so they would go out and maybe take time on the lake or cast in a line or just enjoy their time on the water. And, and it felt good to enjoy a time of rest and maybe some encouragement just a couple of times a year. They felt like it was good for their soul. The problem was their boat was just never that important to them. They didn't service the engine on it. They didn't keep things in good working order. And so one day they decided it'll be convenient for us to go out on our boat and they waved at some friends that they spotted boating in the distance and they motored over to a little cove and they did a little bit of fishing and enjoyed time relaxing and soon they were done. The man went to start the motor and as he yanked on that pull string to get it to fire up, nothing would happen, just puffs of air every time. He pulled again and again and he, he messed with the choke and he checked the fuel, but nothing. After about 30 minutes of messing with the motor, they decided, Let's just row back. And so they uh, grabbed from the bottom of their boat uh, the oar that they had there for a long time. And they found that that wooden oar had become riddled with dry rot. The man picked it up and he started to row with it, but soon it broke into pieces. He was paddling basically with just a stick. They made little headway against the breeze and the waves of the passing boats. And, and they were pulled by every current on the lake. And finally, after an hour of paddling, they made it back to the dock. What was supposed to be a relaxing and convenient thing became burdensome because they had failed with their motor and with this dry rot paddle. But you know, it didn't have to be like that. They could have taken regular care of their boat. They could have tuned up the motor. They could have tended to their paddle. 
keeping it oiled and off the bottom of the boat so it wouldn't rot. My friends, how often do we treat the church like that motor, where we expect it to be ready when we come out once or twice or three times a year? You know, we want great music, we want nice facilities, we want to come and be served in the church, but we ourselves aren't willing to invest in it with our time and our resources. We're not there to make sure that those things are there for others, we just expect them to be there for us. How often do we treat our faith like that or? That it's supposed to be there just when we need it, but we're surprised at how quickly it falls apart because we don't take time to take care of it, to invest in it. You know, we can shake our fists at God all we want when we find ourselves adrift, being tossed to and fro, and not getting where we want in life. But really, is God the one at fault? An unused faith leads to spiritual decay, just like the ore fell apart. When we don't take care of the things that we expect to be able to use and expect to have there, they don't work. They aren't present. We don't get what we think that we should. And so I want to ask you today, how is it with your soul? Are you taking care of the things that you know you should? Are you tending to the things that you need to? So that not only are they ready there in the times of emergency, but they're ready every time, all day long, every day. How is it with your soul? I encourage you this week, read 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 3-11. through 11. Reflect on, and maybe take time to journal on that question. How is it with your soul? The second way I think that it's very simple to fail at fishing, uh, it's, it's not just unkept equipment, it's also unadaptable methods. There's a story about a seasoned fisherman who had fished all day long without getting a single bite, and as he's walking back upstream, heading home, he encounters another fisherman that has a stringer full of fish. And so, in amazement, he asks that fisherman, he says, Hey, buddy, what are you using to catch all those fish? And the other fisherman shows him the new lure that she's using, and she says, Well, I've just been using this new lure. It just came out. It's amazing, and the fish seem to love it. The first fisherman states, Oh, I could never use a lure like that. That's just not the way that I fish. The second fisherman, she states, Yeah, but this is what the fish are biting. And so the first fisherman just walks away, shaking his head, saying, I guess I better just go home. The fish aren't biting today. Unadaptable methods mean that churches aren't suited to reach the people of now. They're better suited to reach the people of the past. Most churches nowadays, and I say this as someone who's invested in rural churches and, and in seeing churches be revitalized and, and small places have vibrant faith, Oftentimes, our churches are better suited to reach people from 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago than they are to reach the people of today. How many of you grew up going to church? And maybe as teenagers, you, you had strong experiences in faith because the churches that you went to invested in you as you were. They adapted their music. They adapted their methodologies. They did things to reach you. And then maybe now you're later in life and you're looking at the culture and looking at your community and looking at your church and because nothing has changed, you're saying, well, why aren't people responding? I think that unadapted methods are better suited to reaching the people of the past than they are to reaching the people today. We are a people who are called to reach the unreached, to engage with the unengaged, to invite those who have never really trod the path of faith in Jesus to come and walk with us on that journey. To adapt a method is not the same as changing the message. We do not compromise on the gospel of Jesus Christ. The message remains the same, that we are called to make disciples of Jesus Christ, the only Son of God who came and lived a human life, that came to free us from sin and death, who went to the cross as a ransom for our sin, and then was risen three days later. And all who confess him as Lord can experience new life here on earth, freedom from sin today, 
and also get the promise of eternal life with him. We don't compromise the message, but we should adapt the methods. As fisher of men, we are called to do everything short of sinning to share the gospel in a winsome, loving way. Maybe today you feel like, well, the fish just aren't biting. Changing the approach to how we do things can cause us to dig in our heels and fear change. But what if Jesus is asking you to take a fresh approach on how you communicate the gospel? And it's easy to point at our Sunday services and say, well, things need to change there. But when was the last time that you really intentionally invested in someone hoping to see them follow Jesus? When was the last time you did something other than saying, well, they know that I go to church on Sunday. Maybe they'll ask me. When was the last time you actively invited someone to church? And if you don't like the format of Sunday services, if you don't want to invite someone because of the way that things are, what are you doing now to make it better? Not changing the message, but adapting the methodology to fit our culture, to reach people, to see them engage in life-changing habits and disciplines that get them really connected with Jesus. You know, it's easy to simply just walk away or stay quiet or maybe just complain to one another in the background. That's the easy thing to do. The difficult thing, but the better God-honoring thing, the kingdom-building thing, is to say, hey, let's talk about what we can do. Let's pray about what the Holy Spirit wants us to do and might lead us to change and adapt. Let's make reaching the next person for Jesus our focus. When we are willing to set aside our preferences and say, God, here we are, use us. Lord, here I am, use me. My friends, you will be amazed at what God's power at work within us can and will do. There's an adaptation of a Margaret Mead quote, and it's on the wall at the Alpena Community Center. And it's a statement that I have come to love. And it says, never doubt that a small group of people can change the world. It's the only thing that ever has. Jesus says, come, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. In Matthew chapter 4, then continuing that in verse 20, it says, Immediately they left their nets and they followed him. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. And then going on from there, they saw others, two other brothers, James the son of Zebedee and John his brother, and they were in the boat with Zebedee their father, mending their nets. And Jesus called to them. And immediately they left their boats and their father, and they followed Jesus. A man from the boonies of Nazareth named Jesus, with a handful of uneducated people from the rural region of Galilee. Yet, this small group of people, God changed the world, and the message of salvation spread across the globe. John and Charles Wesley, with a small group of people committed to living disciplined, holy lives, attempting to rid their lives from sin, and actively sharing the gospel of Jesus. With a small group of people, the Methodist movement was born. God used them. What can God do with a small church in a small town in a small county in South Dakota? Never doubt what God can do. Never doubt what God can do with a small group of faithful people. He might just change the world. Jesus is calling. Come follow me, and I will make you fishers of men.